Answering Islam live once again. I am convinced that something somewhere on this computer is going to start making noise here any second because somehow I managed to do it every single time. And I don't hear anything. So now I'm wondering if I'm even on because I always make noise somehow when I go on <laughs> when I go live. All right, but I see never mind. I see the comments coming up, so I must be live. So, all right. Well, I finally was able to get on and not make a bunch of extra noise. So let me just go ahead and pull up this site so I can see my face and see if anything goes wrong. Anthony, how things been going for you? Uh, everything's going good. See any uh, initial comments that you want to respond to? Uh, no, I was just setting a few things up here as we get started. But, uh, right, I believe we're good, and we can jump right into some questions. All right. Uh, oh, everyone's telling us where they're from again. So, hi from Montreal. Hey, I guess this is now the in thing, as everyone tells us where they're from. All right, everyone go ahead and tell us where you're from, because it is cool to see. So, we've got, uh, we've got England, we've got Melbourne, uh, Mel uh, Melbourne Australia. Scotland, Southern California, more Scotland, England, Boston, Massachusetts. I grew up in Massachusetts uh, when I was real young. Later I went later I went to West Virginia. Um, we have some requests to turn off the slow-mo. Uh, I'm gonna have to have a real good reason to turn off the slow-mo because uh, when it's not on, the comments come so fast that I can't even like read them like if I try to read one boom it's gone off there and I have to scroll back and find it so um, we'll keep it on for a while until we think that there is a very good reason to turn it off Renee says she wants to see Anthony Rogers debate Shabir there's a lot of people who'd like to see Anthony debate Shabir in fact we uh, we're gonna have a comment here about Anthony uh, would like to see Anthony debate Shabir yeah I've been trying for years Everyone loves Anthony Rogers. <laughs> All right, so we have people from around the world, Wisconsin, Nigeria, China, Michigan, Virginia, Saudi Arabia, Nashville, L.A., uh, multiple people in Boston, again, Saudi Arabia, Texas, Washington, Germany, Canada, South Africa, Bangladesh. So we have, hey, West Virginia, Patrick. It's a good place, it's a good place. Uh, Egypt, Portland, India, Algeria, several people from Texas, New York, Costa Rica, all over the place, tons of people all over the United States, all over the world. Well, that's cool because we have a, should have an interesting show. You know what's interesting? I was going through um, the comments uh, on the last video, taking screenshots of interesting questions or objections, and there are a lot of interesting questions that uh, that I came across. So we're going to go ahead and start taking a look at some of these, and then we'll pause to go through the, the chat here in a little bit. But let's go ahead and take a look at one. Uh, oh, these first two are from patrons. I remind everyone that uh, we'll start when we have, we'll start each show um, with questions from patrons. If we have uh, people who uh, contribute on Patreon and send us questions, we'll start with those. So if you um, want to contribute uh, to Patreon, you can. That, that link's in the description box. And um, uh, yeah, so the, the quickest way to, to get your questions through would be to subscribe to uh, Anthony's Patreon page and start sending him some questions. So Alan pointed out, David, come to Islam TV, challenged you to a live debate uh, during the live stream and chat, will you give him one if he doesn't coward out like Abdul S. did? So Abdul S. was a Muslim who said he wanted to join in the discussion. I didn't know that Abdul um, chickened out, um, but if he did, well, that's fine. Uh, so Come to Islam TV challenged um, us to debate. What do you think, Anthony? Are we willing to debate on here? So that would just be on this. We would, we, we would call in um, by Skype, and we would have him on by Skype. Um, we certainly wouldn't take him on both of us at the same time so one would moderate while the other 
uh, while the other debates. So, Anthony, are we willing to debate? Is that something we'd be willing to do? Hey, you're muted again, man. What's your problem? <laughs> you you always complain about my typing in the background. Yeah, that's to get you to, to set up your mic differently where it's not like right beside your keyboard or something. So, uh, so. I, don't why it's, I don't know why it's so loud. But yes, absolutely, we would be willing to debate. Uh, we were hey. we are almost willing to pay him what we want. <laughs> hey, you, you know what I should have uh, what I should have uh, had ready. Uh, might have to do this for the future, but you're 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 old enough to remember this. Uh, a lot of the people here will have no clue what we're talking about. But I was uh, right when you right when I asked you that, I was thinking of uh, remember Roddy Piper when he asked Hulk Hogan, uh, <laughs> "Will you will you face Andre the Giant at WrestleMania 3? And he goes, "Yeah." Uh, that's how uh, we should play that every time we get challenged to a debate we can play that so uh, yes uh, come to Islam TV I don't know if you're here yet but yes we're happy to debate uh, we would uh, if you have some Islamic topic in mind happy to do that if you have a Christian topic in mind then we'll need to pair that with an Islamic topic because uh, we don't want you to pull the same stunt that Muslim debaters in the hat in the past have uh, namely that we just focus on Christian topics all the time and uh, Islam never has anything to defend. So um, some interesting good topics would be, if you wanted to debate like the deity of Christ, we could pair that with a debate on whether Muhammad's a prophet. Um, or you could go with some other claim that Muslims make that we would like to address, like uh, has the Quran been perfectly preserved? But yes, we can certainly make that happen. Let us know, and we will set it up. We could even do it next week if you wanted. We can, uh, we can set that up. So the answer there was yes. Next question. This one is from uh, a patron named Wade. He said, what are the sources for the martyrdom of the apostles? I can't seem to find anything solid apart from the book of Acts, mostly just legends from the third and fourth century. What did you find that made you rethink your whole worldview? So uh, that last part there seems to be directed towards me, specifically my testimony. Um, what was I going on when... I concluded that the apostles had uh, died horrible bloody deaths. At that point, so back early on um, there, where I, where I was in jail studying Christianity, back then it was Fox's Book of Martyrs, right? So Fox's Book of Martyrs includes a variety of uh, martyred um, Christians, and at the beginning goes through how the apostles died. Now, Wade has a point here that some of those accounts, some of those accounts, some of these stories you hear about the martyrdoms of the apostles are based on much later sources. In other words, they do come from something in the, in the, in the third or fourth century. So some of those would be in doubt, provided the story, uh, if the story just comes out of nowhere and we have nothing, we have nothing earlier to go on, then we might call the, the story into question. Uh, with that said, we have a very good idea of how many of the apostles died. So some of the stories, yes, um, from, you know, the third or fourth century would be in question, would be in doubt, um, but a number aren't. So Anthony, what, what's, a, what's a general overview of what we know about what the apostles were willing to endure? Yeah, well, one thing I would say really quickly is a lot of our knowledge of the early history of the Christian church and the apostles and uh, their successors and so forth comes from uh, people like Eusebius, who was the father of church history, and so even though it's a fourth century work, his ecclesiastical history, it's based on sources that he had access to it at his disposal. Of course, people like to question that sort of thing. Uh, you know, they want to be able to look at even earlier sources, and, and we obviously like earlier sources too, but... Uh, and we, is, we, we, would, we would love to have some of the sources that Eusebius had. Right, right. So he, I mean, he makes reference to all sorts of things, and uh, what's exciting sometimes is when you see one of those sources pop up later, uh, you know, we, they've been lost to history, but then later we find something. So sometimes we do uh, fortunately run across one of these earlier sources. But uh, So, so the, 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 the side point here would be that if someone in the 4th century is giving an account or saying something about something that happened, on the, happened in the 1st century, that could be reliable or unreliable depending on where he's getting his information from if it just comes out of nowhere and there's no clue where he got it well yeah we might not want to trust it if he says yeah i got it from this second century source which maybe you guys don't have but the people of my time had it and would know if i'm making it up 
then might still be reliable. Right. Okay. Yeah. So uh, here I just give one source, which is a really early source, actually. So we do have stuff earlier than Eusebius. Uh, but this comes from Clement in his Epistle to the Corinthians. So it's one of our earliest extant extra-biblical Christian writing uh, that we have. Uh, it was written, there's actually some discussion on this. Scholars disagree. Some would say it was written before AD 70, but everyone agrees that it's an early, uh, perhaps towards the end of the first century mm -hmm. piece of writing. And in it, uh, Clement makes reference in general to the persecution and death of the apostles, but then specifically speaks of the death of Peter and Paul. Uh, and you find that in section five of the, the first part of his work. Uh, and, and I'm saying that that way because some uh, sources will, will uh, number it differently. Uh, but the source that I'm using uh, simply has that as uh, uh, section five. Uh, but he, here's what he says. To pass from the examples of ancient days, he's referring to uh, Old Testament believers who suffered martyrdom, to pass from examples of that sort, he says, let us come to those champions who lived very near to our own time. Let us set before us the noble examples which belong to our generation. So here's an indication of just how early this work is. He's referring to people, in, in particular the apostles who died in our generation. He says, by reason of jealousy and envy, the greatest and most righteous pillars of the church were persecuted and contended even unto death. And then he goes on specifically to mention Peter and Paul. So here we have a first century witness to the deaths of Peter and Paul. And also, by the way, I, I should throw in here that many believe that this Clement that we're referring to here, who was the fourth, uh, if you will, pastor of the church in Rome, is the same person that Paul was referring to in Philippians 4.3. So he's, he's just that early. Mm -hmm. So uh, if we're going with very... The, the, the point there, um, Wade, is that uh, Clement is... Again, it's either it's either the 90s, writing in the 90s, or earlier, but this is a guy who knew um, leaders in the early church and very likely knew one or more of the apostles. So uh, this is not third or fourth century information. Um, so you, you would combine this with other information we have, namely that uh, we do have in the book of Acts, certainly first century, um, the death of uh, the, the apostle James, the brother of John, and you also have in the book of Acts the, the at least the willingness of the apostles to die throughout that book. So they're willing to face death. At the end of the Gospel of John, uh, the, the Gospel writer is pretty clearly aware of the death of Peter. So that's another first century um, uh, reference to the martyrdom of Peter. He's, aware, he's clearly aware of how Peter died. Um, you have Interestingly, you have you have Josephus, which refers to the death of James, the brother of Jesus, who was stoned to death. So you have James there, then uh, Clement, as Anthony pointed out, and uh, Polycarp refers to the the sufferings that the the apostles endured. So these are very early materials by first century witnesses or, or people who knew first century witnesses. And so you have all of that, and then of course later sources, later sources which include specifics about how particular apostles died. Those are going to have to be examined on a case-by-case -case basis. And uh, Sean McDowell has actually done this. He, he goes through all of the sources um, on these different stories to sort of see what's reliable and what's not. And he has a book on that, but uh, I've included a link to a lecture in the description box. So if you go down to the bottom of the description box, there's a link by Sh uh, Sean McDowell. And he goes through the stories about the deaths of the apostles to see what's reliable and what's uh, what would be called into question. So hopeful, uh, hopefully that helps. And let's move on. And by the way, Anthony, stop me anytime if you see a comment over in the uh, in the chat that you want to address. Uh, this one is uh, just asking for a little advice here. This is Jesse from England, and, and I know Jesse's here because I think I just saw her in the uh, uh, in the chat box. But she says, uh, hi from England. Um, I'm, de I'm so desperate to learn how to debate Islam. Not sure where to go or how to get started. Any help from anyone would be, uh, she'd be grateful. Um, now, I assume that she's not referring to formal debate, uh, just referring to how would you debate and discuss Islam. So uh, what, what, would, what advice would you have, uh, Anthony? Well, obviously, you need to be very familiar with the Bible, first of all. You need to be familiar with what the Bible teaches about 
uh, God, Christ, salvation, man, uh, and so forth. You can't defend what you don't know. So, uh, I mean, the, the verse that most often quoted when it comes to defending the faith specifically says that we're to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks us a reason for the hope that's within us. And so your first order of responsibility is to be able to explain and defend what the Bible teaches uh, about God and Christ and so forth. Uh, you know, your, your first order of business is not to know everything there is to know about Islam or any other religion, but uh, simply the faith that you're proclaiming and uh, uh, in which you believe. Uh, but then as far as learning about Islam, uh, you, you should make use of the resources that uh, uh, we put out, obviously. Uh, you have scores of videos on uh, the website, on, on the YouTube page. You have articles on answering Islam. There's the blog that has uh, numerous past discussions that we've had with, uh, with Muslims. And then, of course, there's the debates that we've, we've done. I think you have a whole section on answering Muslims page where you've listed all the debates that you've done, don't you? Uh, me, I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I'm not aware of any official. I don't. I don't even think I've listed all the debates I've done. Um, I thought there was a separate section that you made on the on the blog at one point, where you could just look at where the debates are. Oh mm. no, 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 there there is a uh, yeah, there yeah, that's not a, that's not comprehensive. I just stuck a bunch of debates on the on the page for people who are interested in debates. Yeah, right. I, so I'm just throwing some things out there. I uh, think those are, those would be some good things to to do and mm -hmm. keep in mind. Yeah, um, and I would add kind of. Uh, yeah, just so you know, we recorded a video, me and uh, John McRae and Vocab recorded a video titled How to Share the Gospel with uh, with a Muslim, and uh, I haven't edited it yet, but uh, when I do, it should be helpful as far as uh, taking things step by step. Uh, but yeah, as, as Anthony pointed out, you want to be able to defend the, uh, the, the gospel, and uh, fortunately, fortunately, that's not... That's not as difficult as, as some might think. There, yes, there are lots of objections that Muslims might have, but they tend to re, they tend to revolve around five to seven particular objections. And if you can get those down, if you can get those down, you'll be good when um, you'll be good when they challenge uh, the Bible. In fact, if 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 you go to um, well, you're already here on YouTube, but after this, uh, type in the Islamic dilemma into YouTube and my, my video the Islamic dilemma pops up if Christians would just learn that that would like that would like change the face of apologetics if Christians knew that the the Quran affirms the inspiration preservation and authority of the Torah and the gospel if Christians knew that and could show it from the Quran that ends a lot of Muslim objections so when Muslim, so and any doctrine at that point that you can defend from the Bible when a Muslim objects and says well that your Bible's been corrupted you can uh, you can go ahead and show him that he's just uh, he's just committed apostasy from Islam. Um, so those are some uh, initial pointers, and I would say it, it kind of depends on what you're interested in, right? Because some people are more interested in sort of counter jihad debates, dealing with Sharia and stuff like that. So if you're interested in that, you'd want to familiarize yourself with uh, what the Quran says and uh, how to respond to objections to that. Uh, things Muhammad said. We have tons of materials on those, and other people are are more interested in. Um, you know, in gospel issues, sharing the gospel and so on. So figure out what you're most interested in, which direction you want to go, and start studying the materials. We've got materials on all of that stuff. So, uh, and by the way, there are, there are other people in the chat box who can help you out as well. I uh, wanted to recognize some super chatters here. Apple Goo. Hello, Apple Goo. <laughs> nice name. Uh, Top Dead Center said, do I get cursed more than 20 times a week during prayers? If you're If you're referring to Islamic prayers. Yes, Muslims say during their daily prayers multiple times, um, they they pray for they pray to to Allah not to make them like the Jews and the Christians. So, uh, yeah, that, so there there are, there are constant Muslim prayers going up about not being like Jews and Christians. Yeah, and, let me just throw in there that, oh, yeah, that the curse comes in Surah Al Fatiha, the first chapter of the Quran, which Muslims use in their daily prayers numerous times. So. Uh, it curses Jews and Christians and Muslims. There, I don't, there's no Muslim who can really claim to be a Muslim who doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so every Muslim, in uh, whether they are consciously aware of it or not, uh, that's that's what they're doing daily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, if you want to know the if, if you want to know the prayer that, that's said multiple times a day, just open up a Quran and go to Surah One. 
Um, LJ says, the work you do is a blessing. Keep up the work to the glory of Christ. Well, thank you, and we certainly will. And there was one more down here. Uh, LJ says, oh, LJ again. Uh, I have a question. What is the most important doctrine of the Islamic religion for Muslims? What would that be, Anthony? Uh, well, without question, the most important doctrine, according to Muslims, is the doctrine of Tawhid, which is just another way of referring to Unitarianism, the idea that Allah is simply one person. So Allah is monopersonal. Uh, to say that he is more than one person, as in the Christian Trinity, or to say that there are other gods in addition to him, uh, is to violate that fundamental uh, principle. Now, Muslims often will accuse Christians of saying there are multiple gods, but of course that's not what we're saying. That's never been what we're saying. Uh, we were affirming monotheism before Muhammad even got the bright idea, or not so bright idea, to pretend that he's a prophet. Uh, so Muhammad's really a Johnny come lately here and, and didn't recognize that the previous scriptures not only taught that there's only one God, but that the true God is tripersonal and so uh, has within himself uh, everything he needs for communication, fellowship, love, and so forth. Uh, so the, the most important doctrine in Islam is Tawheed, that there's only one person and he's the only God, and anyone who uh, says other than that is guilty of the greatest sin in Islam, the, the sin of shirk. And uh, given the importance of this doctrine in Islam, it's clearly going to be coming up over and over again as we do these programs. And that's going to be fun because we don't think that Islam is as clearly monotheistic as Muslims claim, do we? No, absolutely not. Uh, I pointed out on a previous broadcast that when you recognize, uh, take a passage like Surah 4, 171, where Allah allegedly tells Muhammad to tell Christians, say not three, Allah is only one God. So, the unless the Quran is wrong, and obviously we think the Quran is wrong, and it, it's, it's wrong a lot, but no Muslim can accept that the Quran is wrong. So, when the Quran objects to the Christian statement that God is three, it has to be objecting to what Christians actually mean by that. Mm -hmm. that that's not that there are three separate gods, but that within the unity of the Godhead, the, the same divine being, the same essence or nature, there are three persons. And so we don't make a distinction between separate gods, but a distinction within God, a personal distinction. Now, Muslims, in objecting to that then, on the basis of the Quran, have to be saying that there is no plurality in the nature of God. Okay? And, and this is a fundamental point that people have to get. It's not simply a denial that there is an additional being uh, next to God. It's the denial that, there, that God himself can exist uh, in himself in uh, simply an abstract you know, uh, oneness, mm -hmm. right? It, uh, so, uh, that being the case, if Muslims are going to be consistent, then they have to deny that Allah has attributes. Uh, here, and here goes some of my sounds that we were supposed to have off. Uh, let me just stop that real quick. Uh, so, Muslims, if they were consistent, would have to say that Allah doesn't have multiple attributes, because then they're saying that Allah is not merely one. He, he, he has a plurality within his nature in some sense. And this was actually recognized by early Muslims. Somebody asked the question the other day about the Mu'tazili, and the Mu'tazili argued that if you say Allah has multiple attributes, then you're like Christians who say that God is not only one, but also in some sense many. Mm -hmm. And and so the, the Mu'tazili argued that Allah doesn't have any attributes. Well, uh, that was debated for a number of years in Islam, actually for two centuries. The, the Mu'tazili were the dominant party in Islam. Uh, but what became Orthodox Sunnism uh, was the idea that Allah does have multiple attributes, including his word, the Quran. And here's what's interesting. They didn't simply say that these are attributes in his nature, but that uh, the Quran is something other than Allah. The Quran is not Allah. Mm -hmm. No Muslim would say the Quran is Allah. And so Muslims are actually guilty of uh, the very thing they often accuse us of, uh, of teaching. Right, the, the Quran is something separate and additional to Allah, and it's eternal. Mm -hmm. So they have two eternal things, at least, mm -hmm. and we could really add more to that. Oh yeah, and in in, in in future episodes, we'll be adding all kinds of things to that because you've got uh, you've got Allah praying. Who's he praying to? 
You've got Muslims uh, bowing down to a pagan shrine and kissing the black stone, and you've got the Spirit of Allah in the Quran, which Muslims say is the angel Gabriel, but when you start looking a little closer, you start seeing some problems, so we have got all kinds and, of issues to look into. And, and we can't forget my favorite, since we talked about the Quran, uh, uh, the, the Islamic sources actually teach that the Quran, on the Day of Judgment, is going to appear as a pale white man, just mm -hmm. like Muhammad, <laughs> and it's going to intercede. It's going to intercede for Muslims with Allah. It's going to say, he was my companion in life. And so uh, for those Muslims, since I brought this up, for those Muslims who think that Islam is the black man's religion, your hope is ultimately, if you're believing the Islamic sources, uh, in the intercessory power of a pale white man on the Day of Judgment, known as the Quran, that was your companion in life. And, and Muhammad, the whitest and prophet Muhammad. in history. <laughs> yeah. so. <laughs> Two white dudes. <laughs> All right. Dude, who stole my car? <laughs> All right. This comes from uh, uh, Ankush. He says, Hi, David. God bless you for your wonderful work. Just wanted to know what Muslims answer when we ask, if Jesus was just a prophet, then why the virgin birth? I have asked many Muslims this question, but they say they don't know, and probably I should ask an imam. I don't know if I can meet an imam, and he will not try to manipulate texts to uh, just uh, to just reply to me. So, Anthony, I'm not aware of any coherent Islamic explanation for uh, why Jesus was born of a virgin. Are you? No. Um, uh, the Quran states that he was born of a virgin. Mm -hmm. The Quran states uh, that Jesus was sinless. Uh, but it doesn't really give a rationale. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, uh, in one sense, we might say that it does, but in the end, it doesn't. Uh, it, it does say that Jesus is the Christ, which, as we give our answer for why Jesus was virgin-born, uh, that'll factor into it. But the Quran doesn't seem to have any clue what it means to refer to Jesus as the Christ or the Messiah. It seems to think almost as if that's his last name or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it, there's no real comprehension there of, of what that title refers to. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a good question to ask, and you can expect to continually get blank stares and mumbled speech from Muslims. Yeah, so um, in case everyone doesn't uh, understand what the issue is, the, the, question, the, the question that you would be asking a Muslim is, uh, why, according to Islam, see, according, according to Christianity, we know why Jesus is born of a virgin. Islam agrees that Jesus is born of a virgin. The question is why. And is there any sort of reason? And at the end of the day, the Muslim can usually just say, well, that's a miracle. Allah wanted to, to perform a miracle. But the question would be why, right? Why, why Jesus, not Muhammad there? Because what you have with Jesus is Jesus is born of a virgin. He lives the most miraculous life in history, according to Islam. He is the Messiah, according to Islam. And Allah wouldn't allow him to be killed, which you can read about all the prophets who are killed in the Quran, and Muhammad himself was killed by a Jewish woman who poisoned him, and then he spent a couple years uh, in agony due to the internal damage that the poison did. Um, but So why is Jesus so incredibly different? It makes sense in Christianity for Jesus to be so incredibly different from everyone else. But why, according to Islam, would Allah make Jesus completely different in so many ways? And other ways, in, including uh, sinlessness, right? That, that Satan could touch uh, every child born into the world except Jesus. He couldn't touch Jesus. Why, why could Satan put his hands all over Muhammad but couldn't touch Jesus? Why is that? And we, we ask Muslims and we just don't get answers other than uh, it's the will of Allah. So if it, it must be the will of Allah for Muslims to be quite confused because uh, no one can figure this out. All right. Uh, next question. Uh, Hi, David. Why do Muslims say the Bible is changed because of many versions? Um, well, the, the, the short answer is because they've been taught to do that, not because they've examined Bible versions or anything like that. Uh, they've just been taught to say that. They were taught to say that by Ahmed Didat. They're taught to say that by Zakir Naik. Um, I know that because Muslims every day send me the, 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 same exact, the same exact wording of these objections that they got from uh, Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik. Um, now, j just to avoid confusion, lots of times people point to different translations and they say, ah, look at all these different Bibles. Well, you know, all the, all the Bibles I have here, 
yeah, they're different translations. You can have the NASB or the NIV or the KJV and so on. You have different translations, but that's not really different from what we find in the Quran. That I, I mean, I have, in fact, I have more, I have more translations of the Quran than I have translations of the Bible. So translations can't be the issue. But there are situations where Muslims can say you have different versions in the sense of um, Catholics have more books in their Bible than Protestants do. So you can point to differences like that. Now, just to be clear, everyone, Anthony, when uh, Catholics have a Bible and Protestants have a Bible, are these different Bibles with like different Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans? Do they disagree on the letters of Paul? Do they disagree on the on the Gospels? What's the difference between these uh, versions of, of the Bible? Right. Well, when it comes to the difference between the Protestant canon and the Roman Catholic canon, uh, Roman Catholics don't de uh, subtract any books. They have all the same 39 books of the Old Testament that we have, 27 books of the New, uh, but they add what are called the deuterocanonical books, which are books that were written during the intertestamental period, books like 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, and, and so forth. Now, interestingly, Protestants have classically said these books are useful. Uh, they're useful for giving us historical information and so forth, but uh, we don't accept them as inspired scripture, so they're not on the same level uh, as the other 66 books of the Old and New Testaments from a Protestant perspective. So, uh, no, they have the same books as we do, and the books they add, um, there, there's not a whole lot in those books, though, besides, uh, in any case, that uh, are of any relevance to any uh, doctrinal difference. I mean, there's a few issues, sure, uh, but for the most part, you, you don't get a different view of God, you don't get a different view of, you know, who the coming Messiah is, or who the Holy Spirit is, or something like that. Uh, though Catholics would argue that you do find some things like purgatory and prayers for the saints and so mm -hmm. forth in, in some of those deuterocanonical books. Mm -hmm. So, uh, because we know that most of our Muslim friends just do not understand what we're talking about. They get their information from people like Ahmed, Dida, and Zakir Naik, who have no clue what they're talking about, or even worse, they get it from Yusuf Estes, who's even more ignorant, and as we've seen, believes that Alexander the Great founded the Catholic Church in Rome three centuries before Christ. Uh, so these are the kinds of guys that Muslims go to to get their information about Christianity. So we want to break things down because we know that they've been horribly misinformed. But just to be clear, this is, uh, this is, the, the, this is one of the Bibles I normally read. This is the uh, New American Standard Bible. Um, 39 books in the Old Testament, 27 books in the New Testament. Catholics, Protestants, everyone, Christians across the board agree they have the same 66 books in their Bible. The difference is, in Catholic Bibles, they believe some extra books were inspired that come between the two Testaments, right? So you have the Old Testament and the New Testament. They point to some books that came between there and say, those are inspired too. And so... You don't have Bibles with different Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. You don't have different Bibles with those. The, the, the Bible, all, all versions of the Bible have those. Um, now, what a Muslim will say is, well, since you had disagreement about those books, therefore, that is corruption. And what's the problem here? Well, my Muslim friends, if you think disagreement about uh, what the books that are included are, if you think that means that the Bible's been corrupted, well then, you have to say that the Quran has been corrupted because Muhammad's own top reciters of the Quran couldn't agree on what was supposed to go into the Quran. Abdullah ibn Masud, Abdullah ibn Masud was Muhammad's top expert on the Quran. Abdullah ibn Masud said that Surah 1, Surah 113, and Surah 114 are not supposed to be in the Quran. He said these are Muslim prayers, they are not the Quran. That's Muhammad's top guy. Muhammad said, if you want to learn the Quran from anyone, learn it from him. And Muslims have a Quran that's different from what Abdullah ibn Masud said. So, you've got a problem here already. Uh, if Abdullah ibn Masud was right, then the Quran that you have today is wrong. It includes three extra chapters. If Abdullah ibn Masud was wrong, then Muhammad didn't even know who, who his best re Quran reciter was. Muhammad pointed to the wrong guy. He pointed to the guy who, who had a misunderstanding of the Quran. So either way, you're in trouble. So if you think that a Catholic and a Protestant having a difference of view about these intertestamental books means that our Bible has been corrupted, then great, your Quran has been corrupted too. And by the way, that's not the only problem. Uh, Ubay bin Kab was another of Muhammad's top reciters. He had two additional chapters that are not in your Quran today. So he, so his, his Quran had 116 chapters. Yours has 114. 
so, oh, go ahead. Uh, I, could, I could throw in here as well, there are Quran translations that excise certain verses from the Quran. Uh, one of the things that put Rashad Khalifa and Edip Yuxel on the map is that both of them came out with translations that uh, deleted, for example, uh, the last verse of Surah 9, Surah 9, 128. And the reason they did that is interesting for a number of reasons. I won't go into all, both of them or uh, explain these at, at any great length. Maybe we'll bring them up on a later show. But uh, one reason they, they took it out was because it ruined their mathematical scheme. They claimed mm -hmm. there was a mathematical miracle in the Quran, and this verse upset everything. So you simply remove it, and you've got your miracle. Uh, well, but the other reason is because they said the verse the, the verse teaches blasphemy. Mm -hmm. Because if you look in the rest of the Quran, the rest of the Quran repeatedly refers to Allah as most kind, most merciful. But in Surah 9, 128, which is one of the last surahs of the Quran to be revealed, and the, one of the last surahs of the Quran to be included in the uh, collection of the Quran, uh, it, it actually says that Muhammad is most kind, most merciful. <laughs> and so they said this verse is blasphemy because it's speaking of Muhammad the same way uh, it's, uh, the Quran everywhere else speaks of Allah. So. And so, uh, and, and by, there's also a, a historical basis, namely they came when they're compile when they're trying to compile the Quran into a book, and the, and the entire reason they were trying to compile the Quran into a book was because so much of it had been lost, because they, the the Muslims tend to think that all these Muslims had the entire Quran memorized. Uh, no, uh, Muslims generally had different passages memorized, and some of those Muslims would die in battle, and then they would lose parts of the Quran. So the reason they put it into a book in the first place. Uh, was to stop losing more and more of the Quran. And when they were compiling the Quran, they apparently had a rule that they needed two people who could recite uh, a passage of the Quran, who, who had uh, a record of the verses of the Quran. And when it came to the ending verses of Surah 9, they could only find one guy, but they also found someone who said, hey, hey uh, Muhammad treated him as if his testimony is worth two guys. So there's, <laughs> notice there's a question there, right? Does that mean you can break your, your rule for having two witnesses if this guy is supposedly twice as reliable? Well, that's a difference of opinion. So uh, notice this was not a perfect process. And so if you're saying, hey, different, different versions of the Quran with different chapters, um, that would mean that the Quran has been corrupted because that's what you said about the Bible, then Muslims need to start saying that their Quran has been corrupted. All right, moving on here. Carmen says, Hi, David and Anthony. I enjoy your videos and have learned a lot. I read the entire Bible over last year and finished early this year. I would like to start on the Quran now, but where and how do I start? In my understanding, one needs to read it alongside the Hadith. It's a bit overwhelming because it seems so foreign to me. Can you point me towards any resources? Do I just buy one book of hadiths as I gather? There are volumes upon volumes. I want to be as well versed as possible. P.S. I'm from Michigan. So what do you uh, what do you think, Anthony? Yeah, I think one good thing a person can do is get a hold of Yusuf Ali's Quran with the running commentary at the bottom and work their way through that. Uh, you might also want to get a list of the chronological order of the Quran. Now, Yusuf Ali in his commentary will point out when this surah was supposedly revealed and so forth, but as far as I recall, he doesn't have that listed somewhere at the front or the back of the book. You just learn that as you go through each chapter, that this surah was revealed at this time, this date, in this place, and so forth. Uh, so it might be helpful to get a list of the chronological order in which the surahs were allegedly revealed, and then read the Quran in, in that order uh, with Yusuf Ali's commentary uh, in hand. Mm -hmm. Now, that, uh, that isn't to say that Yusuf Ali is always right. He is obviously a Muslim, and he's trying to be an apologist at the same time. So when there are problems, he tries to smooth things over. But he's also very good at, at a number of points in basically uh, letting the cat out of the bag, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are a number of times when Yusuf Ali... Uh, doesn't appear to be aware of the the damage that certain things that he's admitting uh, uh, create. So uh, I think Yusuf Ali's commentary is very useful. It's certainly a very cheap route to go. I think after that it would be good to then start picking up things like the tafsirs. Uh, for example, even Kathir's tafsir of the Quran, uh, because the tafsir will bring up the relevant hadith that interpret those particular sections of the Quran. So, in other words, it, the Hadith obviously are necessary to interpret the Quran, but you're dealing with 
many volumes of hadith uh, in, in, in Bukhari and Muslim and so forth. Uh, trying to pit, uh, put those together with the different Quran verses can be uh, a momentous task. I mean, I don't think anybody's going to easily do that in uh, you know uh, a very manageable period of time. Mm -hmm. But if you pick up a tafsir like Ibn Kathir, uh, here you have a Muslim scholar who's done the hard work, and he's going to show you this this hadith pairs up with this ayah of the Quran and so forth. So, and, and then the other thing is you can find some of these tafsirs online. Mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, altafsir.com. In any case, you could just put tafsir in a uh, search engine and, and you'll pull up a tafsir. Mm -hmm. um, so those would be some of my beginning suggestions. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and I, I, yeah, I would agree with all of that. Um, if, and that would be good advice because you seem to want to really go in depth. For someone who just wants to start learning about Islam to uh, help in discussions, I wouldn't actually recommend just sitting down and reading through the Quran because that is a recipe for giving up. It is a, is a very, very very difficult book to read, tedious, boring, disorganized, uh, confusing, worst book I've ever read in my life. And I've read some really bad books in my life. Um, and I, I, again, I'm not saying that just because I disagree with it. Uh, there, there are Islamic books that I find very interesting. The Quran is just not one of them. And so, uh, yeah, I would recommend studying topically for most people, for most people. Uh, I would recommend studying topically. In other words, think of a topic that you're interested in and then look up the Quranic references to that sort of thing. So if you're interested in Jesus in the Quran, then look up all the passages that have to deal with Jesus in the Quran and read those. And you could get more specific. You could look up, you know, the crucifixion or uh, responses to the deity of Christ or Jesus miracles. And you can look up all the passages that have to deal with that. Or if you're interested in jihad, then you can look up all the passages that deal with jihad. And so it's uh, it, it's it's much easier to study the Quran topically. And so you can, and then also if you want the um, if you want the hadith references as well, you can do the exact same thing with the hadiths. Namely, find the hadiths that are relevant to those particular passages that you're reading in the Quran. And so. Studying topically does help because if you're if you're studying a particular topic, it's probably something you're interested in, and what you'll find in the Muslim sources is there will be lots of stuff no one is interested in at all, and so it can be very difficult to work your way through that material. Um, but yes, uh, if you are planning on really learning in depth, yep, yeah, you can go through the entire Quran um, if you uh, go along with the tafsir. And and the point of of something like Ibn Kathir, uh, as Anthony mentioned, is if you just start going through the hadith, like if you grab Bukhari, which is nine volumes, and you start reading through Bukhari, well, that's not tied very well in a, in a, in a very uh, clear way to what's in the Quran. Uh, you'll read a hadith and it'll give a Quran reference and stuff, but it's not really organized. People like Ibn Kathir took all of that material and organized it for you. So yes, that will make it, uh, make it much easier to go through. And then anytime you're you're reading something in the Quran, and then you're looking in Ibn Kathir for the commentary, for what it means, and then he gives references to hadiths, then you can go look up in Sahih al-Bukhari or Sahih Muslim um, uh, for the actual hadith and, and read that. But uh, yeah, if you, if you go through, if you go through... All right, we had a glitch. Uh, yeah, yeah, I was on mute, so... <laughs> oh. All right, we had a glitch. Uh, apparently, it started back up real quick, so that should have just been a momentary lapse. That is interesting because the internet is supposedly running pretty well here. Um, but uh, go ahead and read this uh, comment from Nuketown, who is an agnostic atheist. Confused about his terms there because there would normally be a distinction between agnostics and atheists. But uh, he says, Hi, I am an agnostic atheist. According to Christians... Atheists have no moral compass, and they have to get their morals from God. So how is an atheist to decide which version of the Abrahamic God is correct? Now watch, because this is going to get, this, this is actually an interesting question. Um, it says, for example, you say the best evidence for you, for your version of God, is the crucifixion and resurrection. But in Islam, it says that it was an illusion. So how is an amoral atheist meant to decide. We can't say God wouldn't lie because we would be judging God, which is something Christians say atheists can't do, and we can't. So um, if that's confusing, I'll go ahead and break down the objection. 
Nuketown says that according to Christians, atheists have no moral compass. They have no basis for saying uh, or believing what's right and what's wrong. And so this is going to present them with a problem if they're trying to decide what to believe about God. So I have said that uh, the not the only reason, but the, the main reason I became a Christian was because Jesus rose from the dead. And so Jesus was dead, and then he was alive again later. But Muslims say, Islam teaches that Jesus didn't die on the cross. Uh, he was raised, but he didn't die on the cross. Allah made someone else look like him and so it was this other person who was crucified and we would christians would say well we don't believe that that would make god a, a, a deceiver who tricks people for no reason and ends up starting false religions in the process we reject that but nuketown claims christians say that atheists have no moral compass so how can an atheist even say the islamic view is wrong right so just to clarify again According to Nuketown, Christians are saying atheists have no moral compass. And therefore, if Islam teaches one thing about Jesus, and Christianity teaches something else about Jesus, and Islam teaches that it's all based on deception, Allah's deception, Allah deceiving people, that's why people believe that Jesus died on the cross and so on, uh, it's all based on deception, well, that would account for the evidence if it's true, that would explain what happened. And the Christian view, likewise, Jesus rose from the dead. That would explain what happened. You have two explanations for, for the evidence out there. The basis for dis the main basis for distinguishing between these two is, one, just says Allah tricked everyone, and the Christian view says, no, God didn't trick everyone. So, But how can an atheist say, well, it would be wrong for God to trick everyone, therefore I have to reject the Islamic view and go with the Christian view? Because, according to Nuketown, Christians say atheists have no moral compass, so they can't say what's right or what's wrong, and therefore both explanations are equally valid if atheists are amoral. They have no system of morality. Now, uh, Anthony, why would this entire argument, although interesting, be flawed? Yeah, well, the first thing that's uh, problematic is it's not our claim that atheists don't know right from wrong, don't have any... Uh, moral standards or knowledge of moral norms, we would argue that they do. The problem is they're suppressing the foundation for those norms. Uh, atheists believe that certain things are right and certain things are wrong. Uh, I, I don't know any atheist who is consistent in rejecting moral norms altogether. In fact, if we were to misrepresent the person who made I, the, the comments not on the screen anymore, but if we were to misrepresent the argument that was made, he'd probably be the first person to object. You're misrepresenting me. But then, of course, he shouldn't be objecting if there are no moral norms and he doesn't believe that there is something like right and wrong. Uh, the fact is everybody recognizes uh, at some level that there are uh, norms and standards and, and objective values and so forth. Uh, so it's a matter of uh, justifying our belief in them and our use of them. And our argument is that atheists can't do that. Atheists can't account for the uh, imperatives they want to issue to others, the uh, condemnation they want to issue when, it, uh, when something doesn't suit them and so forth. So, no, we, we would re reject that first uh, that starting premise that he has. So we would say the atheist does know which one of those explanations for the evidence is better that he does know there's something wrong with saying oh god just tricked and deceived everyone into believing this fake thing and deceived billions of people for no reason he would he would we're saying he would understand that but even though he does understand that he does know his knowledge of right and wrong is inconsistent with his own stated world view Right, and plus you have you have yeah you have another problem here. If if you're going to say that uh, there's nothing problematic with Allah being a deceiver, why are you taking it at face value that he really did what he says in the Quran? It, I mean, the whole point mm -hmm. uh, the whole point is that well, I mean, you have in Surah Seven, I think it's ninety nine, where it says that uh, the only ones who feel themselves safe from Allah's deception are those who are perishing. Yep. So not even a Muslim could feel safe from Allah's deception, in which case, why would a Muslim trust that Allah is not deceiving him in the Quran when he tells him that he deceived everyone into thinking that Jesus was crucified? Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, even apart from the moral issue, you still have uh, a question of truth. You can't, you can't have rationality, logic, and that sort of thing in a world where 
the one pulling the strings is a cosmic trickster. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, just to be clear again there, Nuke Chan, um, we believe you do have a moral compass, um, but we believe that even though you do have a moral compass, it doesn't fit in with your, your worldview. So you're suppressing the true source of your moral compass. Your moral compass can be twisted. It can be twisted into something else. Uh, it can be suppressed, but it's still there. You still, you still know uh, basic facts about moral facts, about right and wrong. And so you are capable. You are capable of distinguishing between the Christian claim and the Muslim claim. So I uh, hope that helps. Next question. This is from Miss Piggy. <laughs> it's from Miss Piggy. She says Allah needs to be stoned according to His own rules. He had sex outside marriage with the mother of the book. Since the Quran states He has no wife, love your reasoning and answers. Keep up the good work, guys. Now, uh, if if you, for people who weren't here yesterday, Anthony, uh, what what's the basis of this uh, comment here? Yeah. So. Muslims uh, object to the statement that Jesus is the Son of God on the grounds that Allah uh, can't beget because he doesn't have a spouse. However, when uh, we look at the Quran, it makes reference to the mother of the book. Mm -hmm. uh, and that book is supposed to be the divine exemplar, the heavenly uh, uh, exemplar of uh, other books that have been revealed to the prophets over time. And so uh, here you have this mother of the book giving rise to other books, begetting other books, if you will. Uh, and so the, the question is, uh, I mean, the logic of the Quran is uh, uh, you can't beget without a spouse. So uh, if there's a mother of the book giving birth to other books, there must be a, a divine spouse for this uh, for this mother, uh, which and who else is there besides Allah? And so the the basis for this, everyone, is that we're we're pointing out that that Christians need to start bringing up this mother of the book point because it's the only way of getting a point across to Muslims that when we say Jesus is the son of God and they think we can only mean that we're saying God had sex with someone and produced Jesus as an offspring and we say that's not what we mean and they say yes it is and we say that no that's not what we mean and they say yes it is because that's what Allah says you mean and we say no Christian has ever meant that and they say well it's still what you mean anyway it's the only thing you could possibly mean the only way uh, and this isn't just for this example this is for lots of lots of different things lots of times the only way to get a Muslim to understand your objection to his criticism is to show that if you follow his criticism through to its logical conclusion he's just attacked the Quran He's just attacked Islam. So if a Muslim is going to insist that when you say Jesus is the Son of God, you must be referring to biological reproduction, if he's going to make that claim, that's the only thing you can mean using these terms, then fine, you have to, you have to be consistent here. And since the Quran refers to the mother of the books, that must mean there's a mother of the book, there's a mother of the Quran. If there's a mother, then there must be a father. Who's the father? It's either Allah or someone else. And since it's the word of Allah, you should say it's Allah. But, and this is the basis for uh, Miss Piggy's objection here. Uh, hey, Anthony, you keep then trying it, to talk, and you're muted. Well, if Allah is not the father of the Quran, then the Quran is a bastard son. Yeah, and Muslims don't want to say that the Quran <laughs> is a bastard book, right? They don't want to say that. If they do, then please state it, Muslims. And so, uh, Miss Piggy here says that since Allah has no wife, since Allah has no wife, and yet must have had sex with the mother of the books to produce the Quran as an offspring because that's the only thing these terms can mean according to our Muslim friends then Allah had sex with a woman who's not his wife and should therefore be stoned now there's a problem uh, the stoning penalty would refer to adultery so that would assume that Allah was married but Allah's not so it would be fornication Miss Piggy so if you want to use this objection the penalty for fornication is lashes so Allah should be lashed According to our Muslim friends who are accusing Allah, they're accusing their own God of fornication by insisting that when you use terms like son, mother, and so on, you can only be referring to biological reproduction. How are Muslims going to get out of the claim that Allah should be lashed for fornication? It's to understand that when we use these terms, we're not necessarily referring to biological reproduction. And 
they're certainly going to want to do that, in which case we say, finally, finally, we can actually start talking about what it means for Jesus to be the Son of God without your silly misunderstanding that, by the way, is Allah's misunderstanding in the Quran. All right, Anthony, we only have about uh, four to five minutes left. Let's start checking out some comments here, if you see any sure. you want to respond to. Uh, let's see here. I did see one earlier. Um, um, I've missed a few Super Chats along the way, um, but uh, this most recent one says, I'm an agnostic, but if I believed, it'd be Jesus over Muhammad, as Jesus never chopped anyone's head from their body. Um, so that is one way to draw a distinction between uh, Jesus and Muhammad. But, you know, even if, even if Muhammad had been the most peaceful guy in the world, he would still be a false prophet for many other reasons. Um, so, yeah, I think a better distinction would be Jesus rose from the dead. And so if you wanted to believe in one, you should believe in the one who rose from the dead. But in that case, you wouldn't be an agnostic anymore. See anyone respond to, Anthony? Uh, no, there were... Uh, <laughs> there were some other super chats that disappeared somehow. Yeah, we can always, we can always hit those later. Um, we are down to, looks like, three minutes. Um, oh... <laughs> Well, maybe I'll just go back to something then that we were talking about really quickly because I, I did want to throw something in. You were talking about the uh, the codex of Ibn Masood mm -hmm. and, so, and Ubay bin Kab and how one had fewer and another had more. And I, I always find that interesting because Muslims claim that the Quran is inimitable. Its eloquence surpasses anything that could be produced by anyone other than Allah. Mm -hmm. And usually when we say, we don't, we look at the Quran, it doesn't look all that eloquent to us, they'll say, well, you need to read it in Arabic. Mm -hmm. Well, here you're dealing with two people that Muhammad said were uh, among the best of reciters, the best to learn the Quran from, and so forth, and yet they didn't recognize certain surahs as uh, uh, parts of the Quran, surah 1, surah 113, 114, in the case of Ibn Masood. Uh, so he didn't think that those rose to the level of the Quran, and he, he spoke Arabic, and he spoke it so well. I mean, he was one of Muhammad's companions and was considered, uh, you know, especially adept at uh, the, the memorization of the Quran, its recitation, and so forth. And the same thing goes for Ubay bin Kab. Uh, so here you have people who are, are certainly qualified. If they're not qualified, who's qualified? Mm -hmm. And yet they didn't recognize uh, certain things as part of the Quran and did recognize other things as part of the Quran that contemporary Muslims would say are not there. And so. When, when I see that, I always think, well, what then of this claim that the Quran is inimitable and anybody who knows Arabic would recognize its, mm -hmm, its mm -hmm. passing beauty? Uh, clearly, it, it didn't have that quality for these early Muslims who were disputing over whether things should be included or not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Umar, Umar in Sahih al-Bukhari said that Ubay, Ubay is the best reciter among us, but we leave off some of what he says, right? So notice he's saying, this guy's the best. This guy's the best at the recitation of the Quran. What's that mean? He's really, really, really good at Arabic. He knows his Arabic inside and out. And what's Umar, the second, the second of the rightly guided caliphs of Islam, one of Muhammad's closest companions? What's he say? Yeah, he's the best reciter, but we have to leave off some of what he. He's got these extra two chapters. Wait a minute. The guy who's the absolute best says these other chapters are supposed to be in the Quran. I thought you could just read and tell. What's supposed to be in the Quran? What's not supposed to be in the Quran? And by the way, there's the side issue there of the satanic verses as well. Namely right, that right. even Muhammad himself, <laughs> Muhammad himself couldn't tell the difference between verses revealed by Satan and verses revealed by Allah. And, and so, his back and kinsmen. It, the, the challenge was to them, right? The, yep. the, he was challenging them to produce something like it. Uh -huh. And when he recites the satanic verses, they all bow down together with Muhammad. Yes. Everybody see, seems to see no difference between other things that Muhammad purported to get from Allah and this other stuff he later said was from So the Satan. entire Muslim community, including Muhammad himself, could not tell the difference between a revelation from Allah and a revelation from Satan, meaning that Satan can reproduce exactly, can speak exactly, can reveal verses exactly the way Allah does. And our Muslim friends should find that very comforting as they claim, as they do, that no one, no one can write like Allah does. 
All right, our time is up. Uh, we got through a, a, a lot of uh, people's questions from the comments section on the previous video. If you have more questions you'd like to like us to address tomorrow, then put those in the comments section or jump on uh, jump on Patreon and become a patron and post a post a question there. We 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 begin with those. And so, uh, other than that, we'll see you all tomorrow here, same time, same channel, here on Answering Islam Live. Anthony, stare at the camera, please.